Uh, tonight, what I want to look at is Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to start looking at, at verse 13 through 21, and we're also going to start gleaning from John chapter 6 as well. So we'll be doing some moving back and forth, and then, uh, and I, and this really, this whole thing really spoke to me because, you know, with, with some of us here tonight, I know there are some of us that are going through some very difficult times, and a lot of times through this season of Christmas, where we take a time to reflect and we take time to look at some of the things maybe the Lord has done in our lives or the things that the Lord is going to do in our lives and the blessings that he's given us and how Christmas may look different this year for a lot of us and how Christmas will look different next year for a lot of us as well. There's death of loved ones, birth of loved ones. And I look back in my own life and I see that there's been difficult times these last few years with death of loved ones. And so each Christmas, my wife and I would experience, and my family, Christmas always looked a little different. And so what do we do when we're going through these difficult times? We're going through times of difficulty, times of challenge, times of uncertainty, times of that just really take us to the point where we just don't know what to do. And this passage here gives us an interesting process I mean, this story is a story that we've all learned since we were young, the feeding of the 5,000. But there's a process that I want to look at here tonight that I want to pull out that allows us to be used by the Lord when we're going through those difficult times, when we're going through those challenges, when we're going through those times of uncertainty, we are able to look at this process that the Lord has for us here and see that when, the, when, when we're in the Lord's hands, nothing is impossible. You know, this morning I was blessed by our brother who shared uh, earlier, Bob, how the things that he went through, I was telling my wife, I was like, wow, the things that Bob is sharing this morning and some of the things that Pastor David was sharing this morning was in line of what we're going to share tonight. What do we do when we face difficulty? How do we respond? How do we look towards the Lord during this time? And so what I want to do is just read this passage. I'm going to read probably just the first uh, few verses, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into our study. Let's pray real quick, you guys. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. I pray, Lord, that your spirit goes forth, and, Lord, that your word goes forth, Lord. And, and we just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, John, uh, excuse me, Matthew 14, starting at verse 13. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out and saw a great multitude, he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves some food. So the context uh, that we see here is that if you look at the previous uh, verses 1 through 12, we see that John the Baptist has just been beheaded, who was Jesus' cousin. And so Jesus hears this news of John the Baptist being beheaded, and Jesus wants to go to a deserted place. He wants to go to a place where he's able to rest. He's able to uh, maybe mourn the death of his cousin. But it says here that Jesus, uh, actually John chapter 6 verse 2 tells us that he gets in a boat and goes across the Sea of Galilee to the other side. And so we see here that, uh, that he departs to a place by himself. And, and he spends some time there alone. Uh, but then we see that a multitude begins to follow him. John chapter 6, verse 2 tells us that the multitude's following him because, well, let me read it. It says that the multitude followed Jesus uh, because they saw the signs which he performed on those who were diseased or sick. You know, it's interesting that uh, something to point out here is that, you know, Jesus sees a multitude coming towards him after receiving news of John the Baptist being beheaded. And we know the story of why John was beheaded. And if you guys don't, you guys can take some time after the service and read chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. 
But we see that John's beheaded and Jesus is moved by this. And so, but when he sees, when he looks up here, he sees a multitude coming towards him. And it's interesting to see that it, it, it would have been easy for Jesus to be irritated. If it was me, and I had just lost a loved one, and I see people, I don't know why people would want to follow me. I have barely enough followers on Instagram. So I don't know why anybody would want to follow me anyways. But maybe it's my hair, you know. Uh, I don't know why people would want to follow him, but, you know, it would be hard for me to, to be moved with compassion after I just lost somebody. And Jesus didn't get irritated or frustrated, but he was moved uh, when he saw these people coming. And so what he does is that uh, he, it would have been easy for him to get uh, frustrated or irritated, like I mentioned. But he's moved with compassion, and he begins to heal their sick. Now, the word compassion in the Greek, it's interesting. It, it's, uh, it's a word that comes, uh, that it's, it's a very long word. It's very long. I don't even want to try to butcher it. But it means a yearning within the bowels. When we think of the bowels, that's like the inner recesses of our being. That's like deep. And that means he had a self-pity and he had a sympathy for these people. Now, like I mentioned, if it was me, and praise God it wasn't, I would have never had compassion and, you know, that word stuck with me for a little bit, you guys, because when I was preparing for this during the week, that word compassion continued to just come to my mind. And I had to take inventory of myself on where the areas of I was having compassion and the areas where I haven't, wasn't having so much compassion. When we're going through a difficult time, it's hard to show compassion to people. I find myself being short with my children. Uh... Sometimes I was short with my wife. And, and this word kept just coming to me, is compassion, compassion, compassion. And uh, what we see here is that Jesus has compassion for this multitude. He knew that they weren't following him because he was the son of God. They were following him because they wanted to see a sign. They wanted to see a miracle. They wanted to make, establish him as king because he was performing these signs. And yet, Jesus was moved. It's interesting, five times in the book of Matthew, you find the word compassion. You find it again uh, four times in Mark and three times in the book of Luke. It's a word, again, that has a deep meaning of just a deep yearning for people. And so we see in verse uh, uh, 15 that when it was evening, his disciples came to him and said, this is, a, uh, this is a deserted place. And so it's interesting that we see here in verse 15 that, that Jesus goes to a deserted place, but look what happens after he says it's already late. Look what the disciples decide to do to Jesus. It says, send them away. It's interesting to point out that, that uh, it was evening time. They had been there all day healing the sick, doing ministry, ministries work. I was talking to one of the brothers in the back, and he was sharing with me all the stuff they do. I mean, ministries work. And they've been there all day long, and, and now the disciples give a command to Jesus. You notice that? He said to them, send these people away, this multitude that is coming to see Jesus, to have their sick healed. He says, send them away. They're making commands on Jesus. Uh, we see in Mark chapter 6, verses 7 and 12, and in Luke, as well, that, that earlier that Jesus sends the, the 12 disciples out for ministry. He tells them to preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick and cast out demons, and he also gives them power and authority to do this. And in Mark's account of the feeding of the 5,000, it, it introduces that Jesus comes with them aside and gets a report from them on what they're doing and what they've done when he sent them out. Now all of a sudden they come back and they're super spiritual because they're placing demands on Jesus. And I think there's a tendency uh, for some of those who are used by the Lord that can start making demands on Jesus just because we're being used by the Lord. 
or we, we think we have our close walk with him. You know, we're in his word every morning, we're, we're in prayer, you know, we're spending time with him, and all of a sudden we, we start thinking we can make demands on Jesus. Well, Jesus, I want you to do this, and I want you to do that. We start making a laundry list of Jesus of what he can do. No, no, it doesn't work that way. And sometimes what can happen is, is that we become super spiritual. And they begin to make demands on Jesus. I hear this a lot, you guys. We share, you know what, it may be in God's timing. Well, I don't want God's timing. I want my own. We see this a lot. We, we see that when, uh, when the Lord, we start being used by the Lord, we can become super spiritual and give the Lord a laundry list of what we want him to do in our lives. And the Lord doesn't work like that. You know, going back and looking at the compassion part of that Jesus saw, there's an illustration I like to use that some people have heard before, and I've used it before. It's the illustration of a policeman and a paramedic. If there's an accident right here behind us on pipeline, a car accident, who would be the first to respond? The police. What's the job of the police to do? They're to investigate to see who was at fault. Then we also have the paramedics and the fire trucks that come out, and their job is to do a, an acute triage to see who's injured, to see who can be helped, to see who can be bandaged up and fixed and at least make stable before they make the trip to the hospital. And a lot of times, we can be either policemen or paramedics in our relationships. Especially when we're going through a difficult times, especially when we feel that maybe the Lord is using us, we go through this time as I'm a policeman. And you know what, you guys, I gotta admit to this, sometimes I find this in my own marriage, where there may be something that doesn't, my wife's perfect, you guys, and she's watching, so hey, honey. <laughs> hey, Dad. My wife's perfect. It's the way it's me. And sometimes, right, honey? And so sometimes what happens is, is I become to nitpick at things. As a, as a police officer begins to investigate and ask questions and find out who's at fault, sometimes I'm the same way. Instead, I need to be a paramedic and care and love. And by the disciples putting a command on Jesus saying, send the multitudes away, they're acting as policemen. Where Jesus is saying, no, I have compassion on them. As we go into verse 16, I love what Jesus responds to them. He denies their command. He says, <laughs> look what it says in verse 16. They do not go away. You give them something to eat. This is what I kind of want to focus on tonight, you guys. Boom. Boom. The disciples have been now faced with a huge challenge. You give them something to eat. First, the multitudes are coming. They're in a deserted place. Jesus just lost his cousin. They're tired from doing ministry. And Jesus looks up and sees a crowd walking towards them. The disciples being super spiritual said, you know what? Jesus, send them away. And Jesus says, no, I'm not sending them away. You give them something to eat. I know with a crowd, we got a nice crowd here tonight. I know there's people that are facing some difficult and huge challenges tonight, just as the disciples are here. They're now tasked of feeding close to 10,000 people, as we'll see here at the end. And they're faced with a, a big challenge of now feeding the disciple of feeding these 5,000 plus people. And it's interesting to point out that uh, Jesus denies their command. And look what uh, verse 17 says. It says, and they said to him, we only have five, well, we only have here five loaves and two fish. Now I like the, I like the, the, this is from the New King James, but I like what it says. That we only have We'll see here in a little bit. Now, what I want you to do is let's now uh, 
turn to John chapter Keep your thumb here because we're going to come back. Let's turn to John chapter 6 and let's look at verses 4 through 9 and get some insight on on this account here. And it's pretty cool because uh, you'll see what Jesus does as the disciples now are faced with this huge need. Starting at verse 4, you guys. Now the Passover feast of the Jews was near, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and seen a great multitude coming toward him. He said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test them, for he knew, for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they so mu- among so many? Jesus issues this challenge to them to test them. That's what it tells us here in verse um, well, it says it here. I just read it. But it says that Jesus did this to test them. And so we see that uh, he issues this challenge to them, and, and now he's, they're going to see how, where their faith is, where their rubber meets the road, where they just got sent out to, to do the, the work of t- preaching the kingdom of God. Now let's put your, work to, your faith to work. Let's see now what you're really made of. I want, this, I want you to feed these. You know, Jesus answers, uh, challenges us in a lot of many different ways. There's some of us, again, once I say tonight, some of us are going through some difficult challenges tonight. But let me give you some verses that we all know. We all know James chapter 1, verse 2. Count all joy uh, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7 says, In this you greatly rejoice, through now a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith be much more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the challenge or the difficulty that you're faced tonight, you guys, is to understand that it's to strengthen your faith. It's to understand that Jesus is taking you through a process that we're going to see here in a little bit because he wants to use you. He's going to take us through a process. I mean, if I were to, if I were, if were like a little bubble that kind of put up everybody's challenge tonight, we would all be amazed of how many things that we're going through during this time. The grief, the, the anxiety, the difficulties, the just a number of different things. We're all faced with a challenge. And a lot of times when we're faced with these challenges, we point to Jesus and, and, and we put demands on him. Just because we're spending time in the word, because we're coming to Sunday night service, we, we think that we can put demands on Jesus. But instead, we're to put our faith in him. Uh, it's interesting that, uh, that one of the, uh, that Philip Asked Jesus, where should we get all this, where, where we get all this bread from? You know, 200 denarii is not even close to giving everybody just a little bit. So according to the almighty Google, 200 denarii would probably be equal to anywhere from 8,000 to 14,500 U.S. dollars. So there must have been a lot of people there. And, you know, it's interesting. And then we see Philip's, uh, that was uh, Andrew's response. Where are we going to, I mean, 200 denarii is not even close to getting anybody just a little bit. And then we see Andrew. You know, Andrew almost got it. He almost got it. Look what he says here uh, in, uh, in verse 8 of John chapter 6. He says, one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But then look at the next word, but what are they among so many? Andrew just dropped what's called the butt bomb. (laughs) You guys ever hear that? You know, you're talking to somebody and they're like, oh, you know, we're going on and they go on and go on and go on and they say, but you could just disregard everything they just said because the true meaning of what they're going to say is after the but. The butt bomb. This is what we see here. He 
almost had it. it I, I wonder what things would have been like if he just would have turned to Jesus and said, Jesus, we only have these five loaves and two fish. Can you help us? But then his attitude. It, it's interesting that their responses of Philip and Andrew, it indicates that they still haven't grasped the power and the authority that Jesus gave to them in the previous chapters when he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God. Jesus has given each and every one of us power and authority to teach his word. But I think we allow ourselves to get self in the way and we see a response like Andrew and Philip or Philip and Andrew and we can relate to that because sometimes our responses are the same. We don't rely on the power of God. What we do instead is rely on the power of me. <laughs> I've done that many times and many times has gotten me in a lot of trouble. A lot of times. Instead of just allowing Jesus to just deal with, help us deal with any challenge that we're going through. And it's interesting that, you know, that Andrew almost got it. He almost got it. But then he throws that butt bomb in there and just forget everything he just said because his doubt really came out when he said, well, but what is it among so many? And I thought that was interesting Jesus needs to take them through a process where they're able to face difficult times and challenges, and he illustrates this in the next verse in verse. Right, let's go back to actually, let's go back to Matthew, you guys. Verse 17, it says, And he said to them, We have here only five loaves and two fish. In verse 18, Jesus says, Bring them here to me. That's an amazing response. Bring them here to me. So you guys, the five loaves were, which were more like wafers, and the two fish, which were very, very small, enough to feed a lad. That's why John tells us that there was a, la a little boy who had enough to get him by. Now, if that was my backpack, you guys, it would not have five loaves and two fish. It'd have chorizo and egg, some tamales, and my mother-in-law's tortillas. <laughs> but this guy was on a, on a healthy diet, and, uh, and so he had five loaves and two fish. And, and so we have to remember, these five loaves and two fish are not like the five loaves of bread we see today. They were wafers, enough for a lad to eat. But Jesus says something interesting. He says, bring them here to me. So you guys, those five loaves and two fish in itself could accomplish nothing, nothing. But in the hands of Jesus, it's about to perform one of the biggest miracles that we've, we all know about. See, so guys, our lives, of in itself, it's pretty much nothing without Christ. It's when our lives are in his hands that we're able to face any or go through any difficult time that comes our way. And the disciples here haven't learned that. And so what happened is, is that Jesus says, bring him here to me. And, uh, and so they bring him. Psalms 31.5 says, my times, David is saying this about Christ, my times are in your hands. David understood this. But a lot of times we walk around like these five loaves and two fish have no chance of even coming close to feeding the 5,000. But in the hands of Jesus, we'll see here in a little bit, the result of that. In the hands of Jesus, we can face any trial or any difficult times that, we, that may come our way. In the hands of Jesus, we find peace. In the hands of Jesus, we find comfort. In the hands of Jesus, we find a lot of different things that gives us the tools to be equipped to get us through the difficult times that we have through. Once again, once again, those five loaves and two fish in itself couldn't meet the need. But in the hands of Jesus, he's able to bring and meet the need. Now, I don't want you guys, some of you guys to get excited, but in the, in the next verse... Uh, and it's in the same verse, he, I'm sorry, in verse 19, it says, then he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. Now, John chapter six, verse nine and 10 tells us there was much grass 
in the area. And I didn't want to use that verse tonight because some of you guys might have gotten excited about that. Some of you guys got that, huh? I know a lot of you guys got that. <laughs> John chapter 6 tells there is much grass, but I didn't want to use that one because uh, some of you guys got that. It was kind of dry. But look what Jesus does in verse 19 that is so amazing. This is the process that I want to talk about that we need to go through as brothers and sisters in the Lord, especially when we're going through a difficult time where we need to be used by the Lord. This is the process right here that I want to just spend a few minutes on. Because look what he does, what Jesus does with these five loaves and two fish. He says, bring them here to me in verse 18. Then he commands the multitude to sit on, on the grass. That's interesting because Jesus brings, he, he brings order to a potential chaotic mess. He brings order. Jesus is, uh, he's, a, he's, he's orderly. We see that here. And, and it's interesting to point out here that then he takes the five loaves and, he two, and the two fish and looking up to heaven, we see three things. He blessed it, broke, and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitude. It's an interesting process right there that he did with the five loaves and the two fish. He blessed it. He prayed over it. Think of the blessings that God has given you in your lives tonight. Just think about that for a moment. If, if we were to interview everybody here tonight on the blessings that God has given you, We'd be here all night because he has blessed us in a lot of different ways. But the next part is a part that nobody wants to go through. He didn't bless the five loaves and the two fish and then give it. He blessed the five loaves and the two fish and then he broke it. That's the tough part. Being broken by the Lord. Some of you here know what that is. To some of you, us here, it may look a lot of different ways. It may look like my brokenness is going to look different from anybody else's brokenness. But that's part of the process. Being broken before the Lord. Well, what does that mean, John? Well, I can share what, what in my life. The Lord has I had a few deaths last few years, my sister and my mom, and, and I have a dad right now who's sick. And just trusting in the Lord, my wife and I just trusting in the Lord that, you know, you, when you lose, and that's why Bob's message this morning just really hit me, is that when you're broken before the Lord, and some of you guys know what I mean, when you're broken, and it's not just you're just crying over something when you're just broken over it. The Lord uses that. It's only through that process. And Pastor David always, he's been mentioning this a lot in his last, you know, in his, just recently. He says, a person that is deeply broken by the Lord will be deeply used by the Lord. Some of us have to go through that breaking process. He's blessed us. He's blessed us with a number of different things. But then he needs to take us through that process of breaking. Blessings of Jesus in our lives. Then the tough part is being broken, broken before the Lord. You know, uh, this last year I had a chance to go to Israel. And we stopped at an olive factory. They, produce, they have tons of olive trees out there. And, uh, and what they do is they were... They were taking the olives, and they were, when they were making different things with the olives, a lot of times what they would do is they would throw their olives, uh, the waste that they didn't use, they would just throw it in the ground. But then they found out that that was making the water underneath. It was somehow those olives were getting spoiled, and it was really affecting uh, the, the water that was underneath the ground. So they started using it for different things. For And you know, I brought my wife home some olive oil. Uh, they make... So all the ladies went wild over there because they had like face cream and hand sanitizer, all kinds of stuff with the leftover olives that they made when they made olive oil. One of the interesting things, though, when they said when they made the olive oil, what they would do to get the best part of the oil is that they would crush the pit. 
And I started thinking about that. To get the best out of us, there's a lot of times we need to be crushed. And I don't mean being crushed like aluminum can, or I'm talking more spiritually. I'm not talking physically. I'm talking about that time with the Lord where he, we're just broken before the Lord. When we're just, just broken. It's hard to explain. And they take that oil, and it's the best part of the olive oil. You know, Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is near those who have a broken heart and saves such as has a contrite spirit. Psalm 51, 17 says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken heart, and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Isaiah 57, 15 says, for thus says the high and lofty one, who inhabits, inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the holy place and with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and revive the heart of the contrite ones. One more, you guys. Isaiah 66, two says, for all those things my hands have made and all those things exist, says the Lord, but on this I will look on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. In this process of being blessed, of being broken, then we're able to see here in the, in the, in the same verse, in verse 19, that only through the process of being blessed and being broken is now that they're able to, the disciples are able to get from Jesus and they're able to give. They're able to meet that need. A lot of times, you guys, we must go through that same process of being broken before the Lord. And it's then and only then that Jesus will we receive from the Lord and we're able to give back. Here's a good example. In the Gospels, we see a woman that comes in broken. Jesus is eating dinner at, uh, at one of the f homes of the Pharisees. And, and this lady comes in, and she has a very costly oil of spikenard, or perfume, very expensive. I think it's made in Tijuana. No, I think it's in India. <laughs> and she breaks this flask over his feet and weeps and weeps and weeps and uses her hair, which at that time was a signature of glory for a woman, was her long hair. When she let it down, it was personal and she let down her hair and she would cry and the tears of her eyes and the and the oil she would use to wipe the feet of Jesus that's being broken another one where Mary comes in and she has same thing as a different woman has a very costly fragrance and she breaks over the head of Jesus her most expensive gift. Spikenar was very expensive. This is like close to like some absurd amount of money in American dollars. But she took her most prized possession and she gave it to Jesus. And 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 one of the disciples said, Well, leave her, leave him alone. Leave her. That could have been sold for money. You know who that was? That was Judas, right? Judas said that could have been sold, and Jesus says, Leave her alone. She's doing it for my memorial. And I started thinking about that. Here, just previous in that previous chapter, the disciples are fighting who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. They haven't gone through that process yet. But then we have these women that come in and they anoint the feet of Jesus. And that perfume, that fragrance filled the room. When we're broken by the Lord, there's a fragrance of Christ that fills the room. In the process of being blessed, broken, we're able to receive what the Lord has given us and then we're able to give it to others. Whatever need you're going through, whatever difficult time that you're going through, Jesus has allowed us to run to his hands, to be used by him, that in order that we may be used in other areas for him. 
And I think a lot of us don't want, we don't want to experience that brokenness because it can be a difficult place. But as we see here, those five loaves and two fish in, the, in itself could not do anything, but it was until it was in the hands of Jesus and he blessed it and broke it and he gave, was then the disciples able to receive and give back themselves. Now they're able to meet the need of the, of the, of the challenge that they're faced with, of Jesus commanding them that you feed them. And so I, I, I've been going through, my wife and I have been going through a difficult time. And this really ministered to me because, because it's been tough. It's been hard. If I would have stood up here Monday or Tuesday, there's no way I would have gotten through it without breaking down. Not like a shaking and nervous breakdown or anything like that, but it's just the difficult times that we're going through. And like I mentioned, if there was... <laughs> I were to see everybody's challenge tonight. Some of us in here are going through some very difficult times. But remember, Jesus has taken you through that brokenness because he wants to use you in a deeper way. The result? Look at verse 20. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up the 12 baskets full of fragments that remained, now, those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children, which is approximately about 8,000 to 10,000 people. Now, I'm not a big fan of fish, you guys. I don't like fish. I don't like fish. When it talks about 12 frag what fragments were left over, that kind of grosses me out. And you think, I think of fragments, I think a head, a tail, you know, and that doesn't sit well. But what the point is here is that, that the, meet, the need is met when in the hands of Jesus. But not only that, there was an abundance. There was 12 baskets left over. <laughs> Nevertheless, when we allow Jesus to use us in, in his hands and allow him to take us even through the process of being blessed, broken, and given, we see what the results are. There were 12 fragments, 12 baskets left over of these fragments. They're, what they're saying is that there was left over and then some Maybe for the disciples to eat. They've been working all day. But nevertheless, there was still an abundance in that process. 5,000 men, that they said, including women and children. It's approximately eight to 10,000 people. And so this message here today was to encourage that there's a process that Jesus wants to take us through, through the challenges that you're going through tonight. Through the difficult times that you may be facing, just know that this is part of the process that the Lord wants to take you through to get you so you're able to receive and then give yourself. I want to close with a, sh with a very short story. And some, some people have probably already heard it a few times. I know my wife has heard it a lot of times. But it kind of gives us an idea of how Jesus has compassion on all of us. And I'll close with a story. And, if, and so it's about a mutt. And about a master. This master had a big house, a big mansion. And in his mansion, he had these prizes on his fireplace mantle of contests that he had won or his dogs had won, because he was a dog shower. He had a pure breed of dogs that he would show, and he won, it won him lots of money. It made him very rich. But these dogs weren't doing anything for him. He wanted a relationship. He would try to have a relationship with these dogs, and all they would do is win him money. He never had a relationship, so he told his servant, he says, you know what, I want a mutt. I want to find me a mutt that I can love, that I can hold, that I can pour into, and that I can give him everything I have. His servants are like, oh, you're kind of crazy, man. Look at what you have already. He says, these dogs don't do anything for me. They don't. So he told his servant, let's get in the car and let's go look for a mutt. So it had been raining really hard. 
And so they go up the highways and the byways and they stop at a stoplight and the master happens to glance to his right and down the alley he sees a mutt digging through the trash. You guys ever smelled a wet dog? I was trying to convince our dog that went out this last time it rained for the dog to sleep on her side of the bed and not mine. And she's all, no, the dog's not even getting on our bed. This dog is rummaging through the trash. Nobody wants it. Nobody loves it. It's just rummaging. And the master says, the light turns green, and he begins to go. The master says, stop the car. And he stops the car, and the master walks over to this mutt, and this mutt's thinking to himself, okay, is he going to kick me? Is he going to hit me like everybody else has? Is he going to spit on me? What's he going to do? And this mutt has this look of fear, and this master picks him up. And the mutt's thinking, this guy's going to do me in. And he takes that mutt and he takes it back in the car with him. And he's like, this is the mutt I want. And he takes that mutt home and he gives it a warm bath. Then he gives him warm food. And then he gives him a warm bed. And this mutt's thinking, man, when's the carpet going to be pulled out from under my feet? Because nobody's ever done this for me. And every morning the master would get up and he would tend to this mutt and just pour his love into this dog. This dog was his world. Well, one morning he woke up and the mutt was gone. And he couldn't understand why this dog would leave after pouring so much love into the dog. And he went out every day looking for his mutt. He was never able to find his mutt. So one day, one morning while eating menudo, he hears a scratch at the door. It's like, for a second, he's like, oh, no, you know, it can't be. It's been too long. He keeps hearing the scratch. And again, he's like, he then gets up and he's, here's a scratch. And as he's walking through the door, his brisk walk becomes a jog and his jog becomes a sprint with anticipation that when he opens the door, his butt's going to be there. And so as he continues to hear the scratching, he runs and he runs and he opens the door and he swings the door right open. And guess what he sees? He sees his mutt. But this time his mutt brought all his mutt friends with him. And he told them in mutt language, whatever that is, this is the man who loved me when nobody else did. This is the man who got me through a difficult time when I was going through difficulties. This is the man who loved me when the world hated me. And that is a picture of Christ tonight in our lives. That is a picture of Jesus when the world has nothing to give us or when the world face gives us a big challenge or a difficulty. It's Jesus who gets us through it. It's Jesus.